Gamar Joba Patronebi. You know who I am since you pay for this. First off, Patronebi is the Georgian plural for patrons, but I think the word is similar enough for you to guess that. Anyways, this is our first official Patreon episode, and it's going to be an amazing one. This is episode one, The Illuminators of the Caucasus. We'll be covering St. Gregory the Illuminator of Armenia and St. Nino equal to the Apostles and the Enlightener of Georgia and talk about how saints tend to be related to a famous saint, but will remain secret until we get to them. However, I won't be alone in this today. Joining me is the illustrious host of Pontifax, Bree, and I'll let you introduce yourself and your show. Well, hello, I am Bree. I am the history half of Pontifax, which is a papal history podcast ranking all of the popes from Peter to Francis. Yeah, well, thank you so much for coming on our show today. I am so excited because I am a huge fan of your podcast, as I always, like, make jokes about it to you, and <laughs> you, you get all my instant reactions to different things, such as your, you know, <laughs> your your ponte, your, your, the Pope's granddaughter. I don't like cursing on my own show, but it's great having you here. Well, thank you so much for having me, and congratulations on launching your Patreon. It is a very exciting time to be a podcaster. I know. I'm, I'm so excited just to have this, because I was like, I should be doing this sometime. I'm like, I'll wait until the year mark is over, and like, oh, it's been a year. I should probably do this now. And it fits <laughs> perfectly with the person I wanted to cover first, that being St. Nino. But in my actual narrative, I did mention St. Gregory, and I did say I'd go into more detail about him. But I don't want to do it on my actual show, because who cares about Armenia? They're just our enemies in the show. Gasp! Oh, no. Okay, so I'm, I'm bringing up the underdog, is what I hear. You are bringing up the underdog, but he, he got to Christianity first, so... He did. He did. So yeah, so Brie will be covering St. Gregory, and I'll be covering St. Nino. It'll be St. Nino's early life because her later life really involves Georgia, and it goes, it intertwines a lot with King Mirian III, who is pretty much a vital person in our narrative right now because we've been covering his life for the past few episodes, because at the time of recording, I have not written the last one, and <laughs> I think it might go past the three I originally thought it was going to be because Christianity is a big deal. Uh, yeah, yeah, it tends to be a big deal for us over at our podcast as well, but <laughs> this is this is a perfect crossover because he also is very significant and vital to you right now. Yes, he is. So, which is why I wanted to just kind of showcase what Nino did beforehand so everyone can mm. know what happens to him after, you know, his experience with Nino before he's actually introduced to her formally. It's going to be fantastic. Well, and you cannot ever go away from saints' early lives because that's where all the ridiculousness is. The way that Vitas are written, the early lives of saints are wild, usually. It is. And especially St. Gregory's, because, <laughs> so, and St. Nino's, because it, it goes into, you know, it goes into that area where, like, is this true? Is this, is this, or is this just anachronistic? I don't know. Well, I guess our audience will have to make up the decision because there are definitely some some moments that will stretch your belief or test your faith, depending on how you want to look at it. Well, how about you take us away of St. Gregory then? I will. I will take you away with St. Gregory the Illuminator, who is also, like St. Nino called, equal to the Apostles, and the Enlightener of Armenia. He's the patron saint of Armenia the and the first official head of the Armenian Apostolic Church, which is called the Katolikos, which we will come to in time. But to jump right into it, Gregory's early life is incredibly dramatic. Actually, his entire life is quite dramatic. So this is pretty standard for the whole semi-legendary states of the early church, particularly those who get called apostles of regions. And our main source on Gregory, again, Agenthangelos' History of the Armenians, definitely keeps up with the Vita tropes of like drama and visions and demons and long-winded made-up dialogues, much like the Golden Legend would. So Gregory was born in either 257 or 240, depending on what source you look at, in what was Vagarshapat, which is now Ejimziadin. I am going to have a horrible time pronouncing these names, so I apologize to your audience. Ejimziadin. 
Ejmiadzin. Okay, so he was born in what is now Ejmiadzin in the Kingdom of Armenia. And he was the son of Anak, the Parthian prince, and his mother's name was Okohe. So this would have been a fairly cushy noble life, if not for the fact that when he was just an infant, his father Anak then assassinated the king of Armenia, Khosrow II, at the behest of Ardashur and Shapur of the Sasanian Empire, Armenia's greatest rival. Which then leads to Anak being executed and Gregory being smuggled out of the country by two caretakers so that he would not also be put to death. Oh my gosh. So Anak, you know, his his actual name is Anak Pahlavi, which just translates to Anak the Parthian. Well, that's perfect. Anak the Parthian prince. Exactly. And we actually went into this whole little tangent on the show because this was an interesting thing that led to Georgia being taken over by the Persians. So it was an interesting little side note we went on. And I am so glad that you went on it in your show because the whole reigning Parthian families and the seven different houses and who was fighting with who was literally going to be a whole other page of notes that had nothing to do with Gregory. So that helps a lot. It does. <laughs> so as the sole survivor of his family, Gregory was brought to Caesarea, Cappadocia, where he was baptized and educated as a Christian mainly due to the fact that one of his caretakers who smuggled him away had a vision that this was the correct path for him. And you're going to see as we go along that Gregory benefits from a lot of very convenient visions during his lifetime. And beyond his lifetime, actually. Don't all saints have those convenient visions, basically? I don't know if I've ever seen so many convenient visions as I have with Gregory. It's, it's very impressive. So... In early adulthood, Gregory got married to a woman called Miriam, who is called the daughter of a Christian Armenian prince in Cappadocia. And together, they had two children, two sons called Vertanes and Aristices. And both of them we will come back to, and both of them are also saints. Go figure. But Miriam and Gregory didn't live as a married couple for very long and soon separated so that both could pursue a spiritual path. Miriam became a nun, and Gregory sought to become a monk. And once he got established in his religious calling, Gregory felt compelled to return to his birthplace in Armenia, both to evangelize and spread the word of God, but also to, in some way, sort of atone for the crimes committed by his father. You know, the murder of the king and the attempt to murder his whole family. That's not too bad of a crime. I mean, just get forgiven by God and you'll be fine, right? Well, he wiped out, he tried to wipe out an entire family and it didn't go well. So now Gregory is going to go and do the things that they need to be forgiven by God for. But atoning didn't go so well for Gregory. Because when he returned to Armenia, he found it under the rule of King Tiridates III, also sometimes called Durtad in the sources. And he was the son of the murdered King Khosrow II. Tiridates had escaped Anak's attempted extermination of the entire royal family, and after being spirited away in a very similar fashion to how Gregory had been, he had been raised and educated in Rome before coming back and retaking Armenia as part of Aurelian's conflict with the Sassanids. So he definitely would not have any grace in mind for the son of the man who murdered his father, nor did he have any grace for Christians because, you know, being raised in the pagan Roman Empire. However, at first he knew neither of these things about Gregory, who soon became a trusted advisor to the king. But when Gregory refused to perform a mandatory sacrifice to pagan gods and his identity was revealed, King Tiridates was only too happy to sentence Gregory to some pretty extreme punishment. See, Gregory was sentenced to be thrown into a prison pit known as the Korverap, or the Pit of Oblivion. Korverap was easily the most feared punishment of the time where prisoners would be thrown in, brutally tortured, and no one was ever released because no one ever survived. Um, this reminds me of a really good D&D escape game. Who can escape from the core of a rob? Oh, that would be... You'd have to make a character you would be prepared to say goodbye to, because it is pretty brutal in there. I can imagine, you know, it's, it's Tomb of Annihilation it, and I think it'll be fine. <laughs> 
Well, Gregory was subject to many brutal tortures there, so let's see how our D&D characters would do. First off, he was bound and beaten. There was a period where he was hung by one foot for seven days. He was starved and scourged and smothered and scalded and burned with molten metal. He was forced to inhabit spaces with poisonous snakes and vermin and decomposing corpses and so much more. And not only that, but he was subject to this imprisonment and torture for 13 or 14 years. So with that, I got a three on my constitution roll. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're going to make it out as well as Gregory did. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so either. Well, see, Gregory absolutely bolstered and buffed his constitution role because he persevered with loud, ongoing prayers. And now his triumph over the hardships are considered the truest marks of his piety and holiness and are celebrated in ways that we'll talk about later. So Deus Ex, Deus Ex Machina then. Okay. <laughs> Very much so. In, and again, this is where the whole convenient visions will play in, but... We should also mention on that note that part of Gregory's survival was due to a woman who just took pity on him and would smuggle him bread on a regular basis. Now, some sources refer to this woman as just a pious widow, but others claim that it was King Tiridati's sister, Kosroviduct. I don't know how to say that, but I'm going to go with that. Kosroviduct. You just mean Kosrov's daughter. That's all it means. Yeah, okay, well, I'm, I'm working with that. I am so unfamiliar with the whole Eastern stylings of these <laughs> names, so I'm doing my best. You've got this. And the sources that claim that it was the king's sister claim that the reason for her kindness was, again, a convenient vision. You see, while Gregory was languishing in the pit, King Tiridates had gone mad in a way that is suggested to have caused him to behave like a boar. Like, we're talking a full were-boar, sort of running around and grunting and being pig-like. That's awesome. Now, it's, it's so specific. Behave like a boar. So, some of the sources say that this was the possession of devils in retaliation for his torture of such a holy man as Gregory. And some sources say it was retribution after he tortured and murdered a group of Christian nuns who had fled into Armenia to escape Roman persecution because one of them wouldn't marry him. The patriarchy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you are beautiful. And even though you're fleeing persecution, you should certainly want to marry me. Oh, no, you don't. I guess I will persecute you as well. So, But in either case, if we're looking at this as a retribution of King Tiridates, mess with the Christians and get turned into a were-boar is the whole thing that's happening here, and it will destabilize your whole kingdom. That's quite nice. You know. Yeah, it's, you know, mess with the bull, get the horns, mess with the Christians, get the boar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. But fortunately for almost everyone involved in this story, the king's sister was then granted a convenient vision that Gregory, the man she had been helping stay alive, would be the only one who could cure her brother from this awful circumstance. So in around the year 300, after about 13 or 14 years of torture, Gregory was released from the pit if he would attempt to cure the king. And he did. Through divine prayer, he either exercised the devils or divinely cured Tiridates' lycanthropy. And in the process of this, Gregory converted Tiridates to Christianity and baptized him. And Tiridates became a very enthusiastic Christian. I mean, you would if you'd just been cursed to be a werebore and suddenly you were cured by God. And so he shares Gregory's fervor for conversion. And so, in very short time, all of the nobles of Armenia were either inspired or compelled to follow their king's lead and convert. So, I'm going to lean a bit more on compelled because it's either, <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're a pagan, you get killed, but mm -hmm. if you're not a pagan, you're spared and you get to keep your money. I feel bad for the nobility at this time period because clearly Tiridates was all about persecuting Christians up until this point, and now he's like, no, I'm definitely a Christian and you should all convert. I'd be like, is this a test? Am I going to get thrown in the pit? I would be, I would be concerned. 
into the pit of oblivion with you. Exactly. I mean, I would be worried that he'd just be like, gotcha, now you're going to the pit. I, he doesn't seem like a very steady guy. You know, he's just been running around like a werebore for a year. Yeah, absolute monarchy. <laughs> oh, they always go so well, don't they? They do. <laughs> so once the court converted, efforts to convert all of the people of Armenia spread quickly, with legends accounting for Gregory converting and baptizing thousands upon thousands of people. Like, one source even suggested that he baptized four million people in seven days. I don't know what the rate of baptism is there, but it's got to be pretty high to, to get that in seven days. I mean, is it just like mass conversions with a river or something? Because yeah. when I became a cake cumin today, I was like standing there for at least five minutes just to be a cake cumin. Mm. Oh, yeah. So there's there's definitely a lot of mention of the word mass baptism. But even then, four million people. That's pretty impressive. I got to give it to him. That's good. Yeah. That's a 10 out of 10 right there. <laughs> He's doing some illuminating. Tiridates then declared Christianity to be the state-mandated religion in 301, making him the first monarch to do so in history, literally 12 years before Emperor Constantine would legalize Christianity in the Roman Empire. So this makes Armenia the first Christian state in the world. I know Ethiopia will fight that a little bit, but Armenia has a little bit more proof. And the Georgians will begrudgingly accept it because they're like, <laughs> we, they don't know when they converted. Well, so I'm sure, I'm sure they're, they like to compete for sure. And this decree was again followed by mass baptism and conversions, along with the conversions of the Zoroastrian temples into churches on a massive scale. In fact, one article I read suggested that the conversion was so total that historians have apparently had difficulty evaluating what the specific Armenian flavor of Zoroastrianism really was, because there are practically no sources or structures left, and what does exist is so obfuscated by the Christian overtones that they're not really sure what was there prior. That's what it feels like with Armazism in Georgia, because, hmm. yeah, you'll find out soon. Yeah, when they when they convert, they are converting in totality, so it's, it's very hard to see what came before. And Agathangelos' account of the conversion also has this flavored with the newly converted Christians literally fighting and driving off demons and devils and false gods in the physical body to drive them out of the nation. So. Whoa. Yeah. So they're basically a bunch of like, this is literally a D&D game right now. Oh yeah, 100%. There's, there's just suddenly as they're converting a bunch of corporeal demons and devils and false gods, and they're chasing them out and fighting them out of their nation. I love it. I love it. I love the idea of the devils like jumping the border and then the Christians being like, all right, they're not in Armenia anymore. Bye. My head of canon is, is that they just jump into Georgia just to give the Armenians <laughs> another reason to, you know, hey, here you go. This is what you get. Exactly. You guys like these false gods. You can have all of ours. We've evicted them. Pretty much. So with the evangelization in motion and Tiridates appointing Gregory as the head of the Church of Armenia, Gregory returned to Cappadocia to be officially ordained in 302. He was consecrated by Leontius, the Bishop of Caesarea, as the Archbishop slash Patriarch of Armenia, which, as I said, comes down in the Eastern Orthodox as the title Catholicos. And then as such, he returned to Armenia and established his church at Ashishat, based on yet another very convenient vision he had of Christ descending to the earth upon that place. But this was not the only major religious space to be constructed. Many churches were established throughout Armenia and the Caucasus, including the Mother Church at Etchmiazdin, which is considered the spiritual center of Armenia, also inspired by a vision. And even a monastery was established at Kor Virap, the prison pit of oblivion. I, I love that because you can send all the pagans there. Well, I just, it's so strange that this place of, like, horrific torture is where they want to put a nice, contemplative, peaceful church. But then again, they love that stuff. They do. Come on, they have a cross <laughs> to showcase <laughs> the religion. Exactly. And all of that blood, right? Blood of the martyrs. It's a holy place. So, 
Gregory also established many Christian schools and converted the majority of the current Zoroastrian priestly class directly into a Christian priesthood, from which he was able to establish an ecclesiastical hierarchy to serve the whole kingdom. Quoting Agathangelos, quote, Gregory was especially concerned with leadership and education. He made sure that each church had a priest and each region had a bishop. Then he persuaded the king to gather peasant children from all over the country so that they too might learn from him and the men he had chosen. The king was willing also to have some children taught to read and become better acquainted with the scriptures and other sacred writings. Some learned Syriac and some Greek, but all found new and precious knowledge in the word of God. I love how it's just some children are taught to, you know, to read and have an education, but not all the children. No, just some peasant children from all over. You've got to make sure there's one in each area so that they can go and spread the message. Got it. And now, interestingly, in, in something that doesn't get reflected traditionally in the church, he also emphatically embraced the Armenian language for preaching and liturgy, rather than insisting on a widespread adoption of Greek or Latin, which certainly marks out the Armenian church as unique, because many later such attempts to hold on to a language for their own liturgy will be suppressed for trying to do so like Slavonic liturgy, for example. But after 16 years of overseeing the conversion of his home nation, Gregory chose to retire to contemplative life. But in the process of doing so, he did something else that's quite unique. He appointed his younger son, Aristocles, to be the next Catolicos. Then Aristocles was succeeded by his brother Vertanes, who was later succeeded by his son, Husik. So in this way, Gregory had established a hereditary ecclesiastical dynasty that would be a unique character of the Christianity of the Caucasus for a long time to be. Specifically, this established a tradition that one of Gregory's descendants held a senior ecclesiastical role in Armenia for nearly 200 years. Now, in terms of church legacy, that's pretty direct because that doesn't really exist in other church structures. And, and many of his descendants were also remarkable in their own right. Like his son, Aristocles, for example, attended the Council of Nicaea in 325, and his grandson, also called Gregory, was one of the first martyrs in the evangelization of Albania. Question, do you know mm -hmm. which Albania that was? Because there's Caucasian Albania, then there's Albania Albania. It was Caucasian Albania. Perfect. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I needed to include that in, in the notes, but I have it in my footnotes just in case. People who listen to this show should know <laughs> it's Caucasian Albania, but sometimes people don't pay attention. Yes, so he was definitely one of the martyrs in the evangelization of Caucasian Albania. Now, after appointing his son to succeed him as Catholicos, Gregory was able to withdraw to a mountain monastery called the Caves of Manet near Mount Siba in the Daranali province until his death in around 331. But at the time of his death, Gregory was extremely reclusive. And apparently, nobody knew he was dead until his body was discovered by a pair of shepherds, who, not knowing who he was, buried him where he was. They didn't realize that this was probably someone very important that should be buried in a, in a central place of worship. So... This meant that the location of his body remained a mystery until the 5th century, when a hermit called Carnig was guided by, what else, a convenient vision, to the place of Gregory's burial to discover his relics. And this discovery is a very, very important moment for the Church of Armenia, and is celebrated with its own feast day. I love how like his sons were like, hey, where did that go? Let's check in on him. Well, they're used to him being like a reclusive cave monk. They're like, this is normal. We haven't heard from dad in three years. It's fine. No, it wasn't fine. Yeah, it's like, let's not visit him on Christmas. You know, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So for another hundred years, no one knew what happened to the body of Gregory. So when Carnig discovered the body, he took the body of the saint to Thornton, where some of the relics were interred and a monastery was established on the site but the remainder of his relics were disseminated rather widely. 
Some sources say they were brought to Constantinople and back, and that many were scattered even further, particularly during the 8th century iconoclasm of Constantinople. For example, the San Gregorio Armino in Naples is said to have been built by nuns who possessed several of Gregory's relics, such as his skull, femur, his staff, and manacles from his imprisonment in the Corvara. These relics were housed in Naples until the year 2000, when Pope John Paul II returned several items to the Armenian Catholicos, Karakin II, and they are now at the St. Gregory the Illuminator Cathedral in Armenia's capital. Hey, that's awfully nice of them. <laughs> yeah, in the year 2000. <laughs> well, it took them, you know, a long time. Like, a long time. 1700 years or so and it was a big ceremony there were there are many news articles covering the whole ceremony that went with the translation of these relics it was a big deal so today the other major claims of gregory's relics are at the mother sea of holy etchmiadzin the head of the armenian church who claimed to have his right arm which they used to bless the holy mirin which is the anointing oil every seven years there's the Gregorios Monastery of Mount Athos in Greece, who claim to have his skull, and Entelius in Lebanon, who have a forearm that is brought out on Gregory's feast day of entering the Korvirap pit. Okay, question. How does Mount Athos have his skull if the Armenia's capital, uh, their capital church also has a skull? It's not uncommon for there to be two or three skulls for a really famous saint just kind of kicking around. Lots of people like to claim that stuff. So, or is it just like a piece of his skull or who knows? Oh no, they both claim to have the full intact skull. <laughs> so, <laughs> Makes sense. You know, it's just, just the way things go over thousands of years. No, ours is the real one. No, ours is the real one. And they both make sure that they use it quite specifically in their ceremonies. Oh, look, it blessed our holy oil and it is divine, so it must be real. Oh, but we bring it out on procession on the feast day. Politics. Yeah. Politics. <laughs> so clearly, Gregory's legacy is massive, extensive, and very concrete, particularly in Armenia. Beyond evangelizing the first Christian nation in history, Gregory is also responsible for the Armenian liturgy, many traditional prayers, homilies and hymns, and of course, a quite literal religious dynasty of his descendants lasting 200 years. And he also has a lot of feast days. This is mainly because the adoption of him as a popular saint is very widespread throughout both Western and Eastern Orthodoxy, which is, is fairly unusual because not many Eastern saints make it into the Western martyrologies at all. So we'll just run through these really quick and we'll do the West ones first because they are simpler. In the West, in Catholicism, he is celebrated on either September 30th or October 1st, depending on which martyrological reform you're looking at. And the American Episcopal Church also recognizes him on March 23rd. He also receives a special feast in Nardo, Italy, thanks to a miracle. In February of 1743, Nardo was struck by an earthquake that devastated the entire city and the only structure to survive was a statue of Gregory. And miraculously, despite the total destruction of the city, the death toll was, was minimal. 350 people out of 10,000 died, which is credited to Gregory's intervention. So every year on the anniversary of this, of this earthquake, February 20th, there is a local three-day festival in his honor. But now, Officially, in the Eastern Church, because this is where things are a little bit more complicated in terms of dating. He officially has a feast day of September 30th, but in the Armenian Church, he has several feast days of important life events. So, most important of those, the discovery of his relic, celebrated on the Saturday before the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. His entry into the Korvarap prison for his trials is celebrated on the last Saturday of Lent, and his delivery out of the pit is celebrated on the Saturday before the second Sunday after Pentecost. That is a lot of feast days. So many feast days. It's pretty great. It just reminds me of the Eastern European tradition of looking for any excuse to party. <laughs> well, I mean, very successfully at this. I mean, very successfully, because I, I just... Complete tangent, because I love tangents on this show, is Eastern Europeans will be like, oh, we need a reason to party. 
And they're like, whose birthday is it? Oh, it's John Lennon's birthday today. Cool. We're celebrating John Lennon today. Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, they had better work-life balance than we do. They did. Did the Romans have like half the year off? Yeah, years? pretty much. You got to have a, a celebration for everything. Oh, man. What, what happened? <laughs> I know, right? So that is St. Gregory the Illuminator, equal to the apostles, uh, head of the Church of Armenia. All righty. So thank you so much, Bree, for the riveting tale of St. Gregory the Illuminator. By this point in the main show, everybody here will have heard about what St. Nino does after she meets the nobility of Cartley, but it's quite important for everyone to know what she does beforehand. So we begin our tale with three people. The first is named Zavalon, a man who came from Cappadocia to serve the Roman emperor and gain their favor. Off in Colostra, there was a man who had two children. This man died, so we'll cast him out. <laughs> but he left his son, Juvenal, and his daughter, Shoshana, behind as orphans. They don't mention the mother. I'm guessing she died in childbirth or something. I mean, that's usually the way the mothers don't get named. Yeah. On the day of the, the resurrection, these orphans went to Jerusalem and found shelter there within the religious community. Juvenal became a deftalar, or a deputy in the church, and Shoshana served the Neophora Sarah of Bethlehem. I have no clue what Neophora means, and if anyone does, please let me know. I, I searched it up like crazy. The only one that showed up was Deftalar. <laughs> Anyways, back to Zavalon. Zavalon appeared the, before the Roman Emperor, probably Diocletian, and was told about a tribal force attacking into Roman lands. The Emperor told Zavalon to deal with them, and so he did. Georgian Chronicles state that God gave Zavalon such power that he easily defeated them and captured their king and all their leaders. Zavalon then brought them to the Roman Emperor, who, as per usual, decided to execute Classic. them. The tribe, however, did not want to die, and instead wished to convert to Christianity. Zavalon told the Emperor, and they were immediately converted, because somehow Diocletian is Christian. <laughs> Seems like a bit of an anachronism, because if we're judging this based on Nino, on the time Nino is born, which ranges from 280 to 296, then this Emperor would definitely be emperor from any emperor from probus to diocletian mm. so diocletian is the one we're going with for now yeah he loves christians right yeah i think galerius loves them even more <laughs> zavalon was pleased to see his new converts going out and spreading the word of god he watched as the king and his leaders baptized the rest of the tribe and while there gave the people communion and christ sacraments he left them with priests and headed to Jerusalem with rich gifts to dedicate to the holy places. He distributed his gifts once he came to Jerusalem, and while Zavalon was busy serving the Roman emperor, Juvenal had become the patriarch of Jerusalem, which is, of course, another anachronism, because this wouldn't have happened until the mid-400s, long after Nino's death. Anyways, Juvenal and Zavalon met and became very close friends. However, the bonds of friendship weren't enough, and they then decided that Zavalon must marry Shoshana. They married and moved to the town of Colostra. While they were in Colostra, Shoshana gave birth to Nino. Since this was a holy family, Nino was brought up in service to the paupers. Not much else is known about her early childhood, but when she was 12, her family returned to Jerusalem and gave away all of their possessions to the poor and needy. Zavalon entered a monastery, while Shoshana became a servant for the destitute and sick women along with Nino, and Nino served with another Nyafra, an Armenian from Devin. It kind of reminds me of Gregory, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, there's a lot of similarities. <laughs> yeah. However, Nino was a very curious child and questioned this Nyafra about the passions of Christ. The crucifixion, the burial and resurrection, his tunic, shroud, ceremony, and cross. Nino's questions never ceased, and the Nyafra answered them all since no one could equal her knowledge in a subject. The Neafra then told Nino a tale about the locations of the holy relics from Christ. She mentions how the tunic was taken to Metaschieta in Georgia, how his shroud was taken by Pontius Pilate's wife and then found and hidden by Luke in a secret place, and of course, of the resting place of the cross in a hidden location somewhere under Jerusalem. However, one object struck out to Nino, that being the tunic of Christ. She asked about the city of Metaschieta, located in Cartley. The Neafra responded that this is the place where the heathens live, right in the mountains. At that moment, a woman from Ephesus arrived and mentioned that her queen was looking forward to being baptized. Nino's ears perked up, and she wanted to appear before this queen and help her learn the word of Christ. The Neafra told Patriarch Juvenal of Nino's intentions, and he brought her to meet with him. Upon their meeting, he blessed Nino and asked for Christ to protect her in all of her endeavors. 
Nino set out with the woman from Ephesus, and they came to a convent, supposedly near Rome, and met with a queen by the name of Ripsimi and her governess Gaiane, who were both awaiting for a baptism from Jerusalem. The woman from Ephesus presented Nino to Ripsimi and told Ripsimi of all the deeds that Nino had completed. She's was technically 12 at this time, so what deeds? <laughs> holy um, deeds. Holy, holy deeds. Holy deeds. Holy deeds. Ripsimi gladly accepted Nino to her home, and during Nino's stay, Ripsimi and the rest of her household were baptized, coming to a total of 50 people. So if we're basing it off of the earliest timeline that Nino is born, this would be around 288. Mm. Because they then left the convent and Nino remained with Ripsimi for the following two years. So Nino would be eight to ten. Can you see how like the timelines are not matching up? Oh here? yeah. <laughs> but that's classic. You just have to believe in the story. Ripsimi was in trouble though, for Emperor Diocletian had seen a statue made in her likeness and considered her beautiful. She immediately fled to the town of Akarshapat, a residence of King Tirdat the Third. Mm. The Armenian king followed Diocletian's orders and searched for Ripsimi and her entourage and found her hiding in a wine press. He fell madly in love with her and decided to marry her. Ripsimi refused and was tortured and martyred along with her entourage. These were the nuns that that were that as a result he then became a wild boar. As Nino was yeah. there. But actually, Nina was not among this entourage, as she was able to hide in a rose bush due to her small size. Mm -hmm. Nino witnessed as the souls of these martyrs ascended to heaven and began praying to Christ, upset that she was not chosen to join him in heaven. Then she heard a voice telling her to head north of Armenia to the land of Kartli. She made her way north, suffering severe weather as winter turns to spring and to summer. Eventually, she came upon the home of a shepherd. There, she saw them sacrificed to Armaz and Zadin before they returned to their home. She asked the shepherds for directions to Metasieta, and they responded that the river flowed directly into the city. Nino then slept with a stone beneath her head, and a man appeared to her in a dream. Convenient vision! <laughs> he handed her a sealed message to give to the king of the heathens in Metasieta, who we know as Mirian III. He read the message to Nino, and there were Ten Commandments in the message. I'm going to read the Ten Commandments. Those are not the ones you see from the Bible. All right. Number one, wherever this gospel is taught, let this woman be mentioned there. Number two, there is no male or female, for you are one in Jesus Christ. Hmm. Number three, go and teach all the heathens, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Four, the light began to shine over the heathens for the glory of the people of Israel. Five. Wherever the gospel of this kingdom is taught, it will be repeated in the whole world. Six, who listens and receives you, receives me, and who receives me, receives the one who sent me. Seven, and the Lord loved Mary very much, for he always listened to her true words. Eight, do not be afraid of those who kill your body, but who cannot kill your soul. Nine, and Jesus said to Mary Magdalene, go, woman, and bring the news to my brothers and sisters. And ten, wherever you preach, preach in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Those are fairly progressive and, and female positive commandments. You know, they, they are. And it is, you know, this is Nino. Yeah. This, this is why. <laughs> and you're going to notice here that there's more named women than there are named men, actually. Which is surprising, because this is written in the 1100s. Yeah, wild. I know. Nino awoke and made her way towards Metisheta. She was terrified for her life, as the path was dangerous for such a young child with wild beasts roaming the land. Nino found the place where the stream towards Metisieta and grew content as she now had companions coming along with her, with whom she arrived to the town of Udnisi. There, she saw how the people worshipped Ahura Mazda and Armazi. Her soul grieved for the heathens and their idolatry. She entered the Jewish temple and stayed there for a month and observed the workings of the country. One day, a caravan of people made their way to Metisieta for trading, and more importantly, to sacrifice to Armaz. Nino silently followed them. Arriving at the city, Nino observed as the Zoroastrian fire priest and citizens of Metisieta worshipped the fire altar. She grieved more for these people who had damned their souls away from Christ. The following day, a trumpet sounded. Do, 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 do. And Queen Nana came out and she began decorating the streets with many colored dresses and leaves. As she did so, King Mirian walked out with a gaze both frightening and dazzling. The citizens began glorifying King Mirian. Nino asked a Jewish woman who stood beside her who the king was standing beside. The woman responded, It is a god of gods, Armaz, and there is no idol besides him. Nino entered the fortress of Armazi and sat close to the idol of Armaz by a cleft in the wall. What she witnessed was just inconceivable to her. 
The fear emanated from the king, his aristavi, or his nobility, and the people of the city from the idols. When Nino more closely examined the idol, she saw, quote, a man of copper who had a golden chainmail on his body and a hard helmet on his head. His shoulders and eyes were adorned with precious stones, emeralds, and barrels. He held a sword in his hand, which shone like lightning, and which he was rotating. Nobody dared to touch him, being afraid for their lives. Fancy. End quote. Very fancy. To the left of Armazi stood a man of gold named Gatsi, and to his left a man of silver named Gaim. These were the gods placed down by the early Parnavazid kings and revered as deities in Kartli. Nino cried intensely for Kartli because the light of Christ was obscured while these false gods held sway. Her tears would not stop when she saw how the all-powerful Mirian and his Aristavi were in a living hell while they worshipped these idols. To Nino, the Kartveli had abandoned the creator as they worshipped stones, trees, copper, and forged iron as gods. At this moment, the words of her uncle, Patriarch Juvenal, appeared in her head. She was sent there to help the people who struggle with God. She lifted her eyes to the heaven and said, quote, O Lord, I appeal to your great and your all-embracing generosity. Do not leave them without your care, for a man is made in your image, and you alone of the Holy Trinity became a man for their sake and saved the whole universe. Look favorably on this tribe and bring your wrath upon the masters of an unruly world and the lords of the dark, and help me, my Lord, your servant, in my effort to show them the whole world. So the North can rejoice with the South, and every language can worship you, the only God, in the name of Christ, your Son, who is the one worthy of thanks and praise. End quote. As Nina finished her prayer, a wind blew from the west, and the sounds of thunder filled the skies, blocking out the sun. This is a horrible omen for the people of Kartli. They ran for cover, and the dark clouds appeared over the palace where the idols stood, and in a flash, lightning struck the idols, leaving them as nothing more than ash. Go, oh, Jesus! <laughs> The intense wind blew down the walls of the fortress and away from Nino, who remained peacefully praying in her hiding spot. So God saved Nino, but destroyed everything else. I mean, that seems like, that's sort of like the, the earthquake in Nardo. It saved everybody except those 350 people. Screw them in particular. <laughs> exactly. Once the wind and lightning had calmed down, Nino came out of her hiding spot in the rock cleft and went to the front ledge of the fortress. There stood a tall and acacia tree with fine branches. She approached the tree, traced the cross of Christ, and prayed there for six days, giving thanks to God for his actions, and to show mercy to the people who had strayed. The day of the destruction of the idols was the sixth day of August, the same day of which Jesus Christ transfigured before his disciples, according to the Chronicles. <laughs> yeah, so specific. It was very specific. I had to, I had to include it. <laughs> The following day, King Mirian walked out of his palace and began looking for the gods he had cared for since he was seven years old, but could not find them anywhere. The Kartveli people were frightened at their disappearance and began grieving, assuming it was Armaz's enemy, Etrusian, the god of the Chaldeans, who had destroyed him. Armaz had brought the sea upon Etrusian, and Etrusian had taken his vengeance upon him. I'm, I'm only mentioning all this pagan talk because this is really the only information we have about these gods. I mean, they saw it get destroyed by lightning. I know. However, a more knowledgeable Kartveli citizen spoke up and said, All this has been done by the power of the god who turned Tirdat into a wild boar, in the same power through which he again became a man. No other god can do such a thing. This story was mentioned by Bree earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he, he acted like a boar, and then everyone's like, he became a boar. Yeah, he was a boar, running around and grunting. Very, very lycanthrope. Yeah, it's, it's, it feels like the telephone game into, came in full action here. Oh, yes. With the words of this unknown person, the people in Cartley began instead to turn their attention to Christ. So, you know, did the action, and then this random stranger's like, it was God that did this. It was Jesus Christ. <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah, let's look at Christ now. Yeah. Jesus, he's got the lightning bolts. He's got the, the power to make you crazy like a boar. I'd be afraid. I know. I would too. So, Dino rested under the shade of the tree and was approached by a woman named Shroshana. <laughs> They're really creative <laughs> of names here, aren't they? <laughs> Perfect. Yep. Her mom is Shroshana. This is Shroshana. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it's not just a bunch of, of Constantine and Constantius and Constans forever. I mean, yeah. Nino told the woman that what she was doing in Cartley, but hid her relation to the Patriarch of Jerusalem and instead passed herself off as a prisoner. So see, here's a, here's a really cool thing that I was going to mention to end, but it makes sense now. In some writings of Nino's story, she's actually a slave girl. Mm, yes. 
instead of being like the related to the patriarch, she's like, no, but she's actually a slave girl who accepted Christ into her. That actually covers both of the major tropes about the early saints in the church. They are either always slaves or very noble. There's not a lot of middle class saints in this time period. Yeah. Shoshana wanted Nina to join her at King Miriam's palace, but Nina refused, prompting Shoshana to leave. Three days later, Nina went into the city, crossed the Mitkvari River, and entered the king's garden. There she saw the house of a watchman and entered the house. There she met a woman named Anasto. The woman saw Nino and welcomed her into her home, washed her hands, oiled them, and offered bread and wine. Nino stayed there for nine months. During this time, Nino learned that Anasto and her husband were having trouble conceiving. Uh, Nino, yeah, you can see why it's nine, nine months, months exactly. Now. Yep. <laughs> Nino suddenly had a very convenient dream <laughs> where she once again saw the man from her last dream and told her to have her host eat the soil from a vine that is ready to blossom with fragrant flowers. This will let them have a son. Okay. Because, you know, sons are important. Yep. Yeah. Well, you got to have all of the methods <laughs> to get the boy, right? Exactly. She related this to her host, and they did such. All the while, Nino told them the ways of Christ. So just imagine, these people are eating soil, and Nino's there just kind of saying, here, here's the word of the Gospels. Here's the word about Christ. Did you know that Jesus is really great? How's that dirt tasting? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nino prayed for them and gave them the soil, where the couple then had a, one son and many daughters. Ah, okay. Yeah. Side note. I love how the husband isn't named at all. So I'm going to call him Jeff. This is, this is an inversion of that trope that women never get named. I love this. It's clearly, Nino is like early feminism in religious writing. Actually, the priest I interviewed did say ah, that. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So naturally, the couple converted and secretly became Nino's disciples. Leaving him at the end of nine months, Nino found a thorny bush in the outskirts of the city and made it her shelter. In the meantime... She needed a way to venerate Christ and made a cross out of grapevines. Legend has it that this cross came to her in another convenient dream, this time visited by the Virgin Mary, who handed Nino this grapevine cross, and Nino entwined the cross into her hair to secure it when she woke up. So she woke up and just had surprise cross in her hair. I mean, those are the kind of dreams that you have when, you know, you've gotten your hair stuck in something, and then you wake up and it is all really stuck. You're like, oh... That's why I was dreaming that way. Yeah, I don't. I have short hair, so I wouldn't know that. Oh yeah, if you get like, like if you got something stuck in it, or it's hiding behind your pillow, and then you have a dream about getting your hair pulled, or yeah. Oh, those are the worst. Yeah. So Nino then placed the grapevine cross under the bush and prayed incessantly day and night. The couple served her and were in awe of her deeds, as and at how she was able to fast, pray, and keep her vigil for so long. Divine purpose. However, Nino had not forgotten her original purpose for coming here. She was here to find the tunic of Christ that she learned about from her Neophora. So, naturally, she questioned the local Jews to find out about the cloak, since they're the ones who brought it over. And the one who answered her was a Jew named Abiatar, and she preached the gospel of Christ to him and his daughter Sidonia. She converted them and six other Jewish women. However, they weren't able to be officially converted because there were no priests who could do so, and they became her disciples in secret because, you know, she's a woman and she can't Yeah, priest gotta be a man. Nino, aside from her search, healed people through the will of Christ and cured many lepers, mostly without the use of medicine. She stayed in Metasieta for three years, and Miriam, in the meantime, was off fighting alongside the Persians against Emperor Diocletian and Galerius. Ah, uh, yes, of course. Oh, this is also kind of anachronistic because depending on where, like, Nino comes in, it's like... How long has she been here? How long has she not been here? Well, look, they've just made it because there's always a, a conflict between the Persians and the Romans. And these areas of the world are right in the middle, Armenia. So let's just fight around it. I mean, King Mirian was in that actual war. So. Perfect. So then they've got an actual yeah. like anchor point for this narrative. They do. The search for the Tunic of Christ continued, and Nino continued having the same vision over and over. Quote, she dreamed, while kneeling, as if some heavenly black birds came flying. They plunged into the river, washed themselves, and came out white. Then coming into the garden, they picked vines and ate flowers. They approached Saint Nino with desire and love, as if the garden was hers, and surrounded her with wonderful singing. End quote. Nino recounted this to Sidonia, and Sidonia responded that Nino would turn these places into a garden, which I'm guessing is the foreshadowing of her turning everyone Christian here? Yeah, tending to the flock or tending to the garden as a spiritual metaphor. Soon enough, King Mirian returned from his battles against the Romans, and at that moment, 
Nino had began praising Christ openly. Oh, no. Uh -oh. Yeah. She showcased her grapevine cross to everyone and performed miracles with it. The cross healed the lepers by touch alone. So I'm just imagining her just kind of running around like, look at it, look at it, look at it. I got this from the Virgin Mary. I mean, wouldn't you, though? I would, Everybody yeah. Everybody look at my holy cross. Nino wasn't the only one at work. Her disciples worked tirelessly to convert the populace. And Abiatar became, quote, a new Paul who tirelessly and fearlessly propagated Christ's faith, mm, end quote. A Paul, hey? However, the Jews, as written by Christians, are said to have rebelled against Abiatar and wanted to stone him. He was saved by Miriam's intervention, since he was becoming interested in the Christian faith, having heard so much from Armenia and Rome. Because some context, during the fight with per between Rome and Persia, and with Diocletian and Galerius, he was like, I my army got destroyed. I'm going to surrender and become Rome's vassal mm. now, so they don't kick me out of my throne. Of course. That was an but not necessarily a way to be kicked off the throne, but a way to keep your throne just with someone overseeing you now as well. However, despite his interest, he struggled to associate with Nino and her disciples since he could not convert from his Armazi Zoroastrian faith so easily, and Queen Nana was harshly against Christianity. Mm -hmm. So he actually practiced two religions because he was Persian and he had to do the Georgian things, but <laughs> synergy, so. Syncretism, let's make it all work together. <laughs> I mean, it kind of does. This did not stop Mirian from sending people to question Nino incessantly. She told them of the new and old books and turned fools into sages with her wisdom. All she did only helped kindle the love of Christ in the hearts of the Kartveli. At this time, there was a youth who had become gravely ill to the point of death. Is, is he ill or is he dead? I don't know. Gravely ill on his deathbed. Turning gray as we see. <laughs> Turning gray as we see. No medicine could save him, not even sacrifices to Armazi. The doctors took a look at him and couldn't find a way to help him other than to end his suffering early. So imagine if your doctor's like, yeah, you don't got long to live. Let's just put a pillow over his face. <laughs> and of course, this boy's mother was a heathen who had always abused the Christians and prevented others from visiting and learning more from St. Nino. Mm. Karma, isn't it? Always. Mess with the Christians and get the horns. Haven't they learned? She had heard about Nino's miraculous works and came to Nino's rosebush and prostrated herself before her begging for a cure for her child. Nino said to her that she could not give the boy a cure for man, but from Christ. Who could cure the suffering boy? Mm -hmm. The boy was placed on a hair bed, Ew. and Nino began... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Nino began praying over the dying child. Nino prayed throughout the day and night, and the boy recovered. The mother of the boy then accepted Christ in her heart and became Nino's disciple and followed her everywhere, glorifying God with everything she did, and then Queen Nana became dun, sick. Dun, dun. And this is where I'm stopping this narrative <laughs> because the rest of it will collide into our actual narrative, which will have been covered by the time this comes Perfect. out. Perfect. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so if you want to know more, you probably already heard it. <laughs> um, but Nino does have some relics. Yes. So St. Nino's cross can, found, can be found at the Sioni Cathedral in Tbilisi. And it was originally at the Svetitz Kaveli Cathedral until it was taken by the Armenians, <laughs> and recovered by King David the Builder. This is her grapevine cross? This is her grapevine okay. cross. Yeah, so it was the grapevine cross was taken by the Armenians <laughs> and recovered by King David the Builder in like the 1100s. Perfect. So, Very yeah. convenient. So it's, it's down to Belisi, supposedly. <laughs> uh, her remains are currently in the Bodbe Monastery, which is in eastern Georgia near the town of Signagi, which is really far from Tbilisi. But if because of the mountains. This is supposedly to be near the place where she died and was made the monastery of choice for future king's coronations. Mm -hmm. And this is pretty much all we have left with her relics. And then just a bit about her legacy. Nina became a rather popular name for women in the Republic of Georgia with over 88,000 girls over the age of 16 with that name. It's a good name. It is a good name. I like the name yeah. Nino. And, like, the, the fact that the population of Georgia is currently 3.7 million and, like, 88,000 over the age of 16 have that name. So there's, like, a bunch of kids younger than that mm. with that name, too. Yeah. It's a good name, though. I like it. Yeah, I do, too. It's still pretty popular. It's quite nice. Feast days. You know, feast days are simpler than St. Gregory the Illuminators because you only have the one. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's January 14th for the Catholics. 
and January 27th for the Orthodox, which in the Julian calendar is still January 14th. And that's St. Nino. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> I guess that's how they correlate, don't they? Yeah. Damn calendar. <laughs> the damn calendar. It makes it, it makes everything so difficult. So I was like, oh, I had the same feast day as like, you know, King Tamar or Saint Tamar, Queen, mm. Saint, Queen King, Saint Tamar. And it's like, oh, no, it's actually two weeks later. So you actually don't. I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> um, but, Feast days always have to be complicated, but at least it's not like the fourth Saturday after the second Sunday of Pentecost. <laughs> I know, right? Not, <laughs> trying to like actually work that out on a calendar is impossible. <laughs> I know. The Armenians do it, so they, they can deal with it. Yeah, they can do the work for me. I did want to cover that Nino is supposedly related to St. George through her dad's side. Of course side. she is. <laughs> yep. And uh, so she's related to St. George. Her, her dad, Zavalon, is like his brother. And, you know, it kind of comes around the time of Diocletian, which is when St. George was supposedly alive, I think. So here's the thing about big saints like St. Saint George is that there is a tradition uh, that all the saints around that time period, particularly important saints like Nino being the apostle of the, of the Georgians or St. Gregory being the apostle of the Armenians, generally speaking throughout, particularly the 4th through about the 10th century, to establish greater legitimacy. There is sort of a sainthood by proximity thing that goes on, and they love to associate one saint with another. So it's very common to have uh, missionaries that then get associated being related to any particular pope or any particular major saint. And because St. George is the patron saint of many countries, including a lot of the early Christian countries, Ethiopia, Georgia, um, and he's also claimed, of course, in England and in Moscow, there are many, many motivations to bring people close to them. Yeah. Uh, but at least, Saint, at least Nino was actually close to the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was he was generally considered to be, a, like, he was a, a patron saint. Or he's a tied with the Greeks, the Romans, the Cappadocians, the Syrians, like, everybody. There's a little bit of St. George, so there is more of a reach to actually connect those ones. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense to me. One thing I do love is just basically how it's like, oh yeah, it's, when, when people tell me, why is it, oh, George is called Georgia because of St. George, and I'm just sitting there like, <laughs> no, it's not, it's not, you're wrong. Because um, they're like, oh yes, you know, Georgia, you know, George, St. George, Georgia, it's on our flag. You know, St. George's cross is on the Georgia flag. and Yes, yeah. Yeah, there's four of them. And I was like, okay, you know, maybe it's not because of Georgia. And if you look at these etymological things, it's actually because of the Persian words that the that everyone else took because no one could say Sakhar Velo. But here, but again, this is one of those things that there. It's easy to believe that it, Georgia is called that because of George because there, it's the same belief system that also goes with. Oh yeah, he definitely fought a dragon. It's just much easier to say like a bunch of easy holding on phrases rather than to talk about Sacravello. Sacravello, yeah. Makes, <laughs> makes sense, yeah. But St. George is still pretty cool, and I think Nino is also pretty cool. This is pretty much like once she converts, like, St. King Mirian and Queen Nana, it gets very much the... She's just doing other things, which I'm going to cover because I kind of have to. Mm. But I can go into them really quickly over if you want me to. Oh, if you like. I mean, I'm fascinated by her in general because... As far as as female saints go, usually women become saints either through being inspired to religion or to be a consecrated virgin and are martyred for that or for their beauty. So there's not as many female saints that have such an actual impact on politics and religion and conversion the same way that Nino does. So I'd love to hear more about her. Okay, this will be off the cuff then. So <laughs> too long didn't read version of it is that Queen Nana got sick, as I mentioned, and at that point, she heard about St. Nino, and she was like, bring, you know, bring that woman to me so she can heal me, and St. Nino was like, I'm not going anywhere, you come to me, and then, you know, so, so Queen Nana had to be brought out, like, on a stretcher, basically, to go see St. Nino <laughs> at a <her> rose bush. <laughs> Because Saint Eno sounds like a badass with boundaries, and I, I'm kind of here for that. <laughs> she is, and like, and what's great is like, you know, she she makes her prostrate before Saint Nino and like 
you know, and then she, you know, she prays for her. She Queen Nana is miraculously healed, and then she's like, oh, then Queen Nana is all about Nino, and she brings Nino back to the palace, and then mm. she's like, she goes to King Mirian, she's like, Mirian, Mirian, look at Nino, Nino's great, and then Mirian's like, I'm not converting at all because it's it's a stupid idea. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, and then he goes hunting one day, and then he has a hunting accident. Of course. <laughs> but he doesn't die. He actually can't see at all. He goes blind. Was and it then, a hunting accident with a wild boar, King Tiridates? <laughs> they actually really hated each other. <laughs> I believe it. So what ended up happening is King Myriad was like, you know, I prayed to Armazi and I prayed to Arhua Mazda. Nothing happened. So let me pray to the so-called God, this Christ person. And then next thing you know, he could see again. Yeah. Um, yeah, he could see the light of Christ, you know, healed his eyes. He could see the Miracles. light again. <laughs> and the, the best part is, it's like, the if you look read the historical things, it says there was an eclipse that day. Of course <laughs> there was. <laughs> there was an eclipse. And <laughs> so there are so many eclipses and comets in, in miraculous literature that I actually started to start consulting astronauts astronomical guides to see if there were in fact any possibility that that actually happened at that time yeah so th so just to kind of go on a bit more of a tangent um because were you if we if you use this eclipse some places say that georgia converted in the 330s early 330s but if you go based off of the eclipse that is mentioned in the chronicles and all that it was 319, which is well before the Council of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'm going to use a 319 date because it makes Georgia look better. Um, so, <laughs> but not as good as Armenia with their 301. Ah, <laughs> uh, don't remind them. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, you know, Miriam was like, I'm going to be a Christian now. And he got baptized. Then he was, then he sends a letter to Emperor Constantine. He's like, Constantine, send me all your priests and architects because I am a Christian and I want to build churches and I want to build this and that. And he sends it over. And, you know, Constantine is like, yeah, heck yeah, let's do that. And mm -hmm. then he comes back with all this stuff and they're building a church and St. Nino's kind of hanging out with them. And this is another miracle. Um, so basically there's this massive piece of lumber because there was this big tree where that was in Mitisieta because that is actually under that tree is where Christ's tunic was buried. Mm. And it sprouted this massive, immense tree. So they cut the tree down. Of course. And they use it for timber to build the foundation for the, the foundation pillar for the church, which is Fetitz Kaveli Church in Georgia. And, but nobody can lift it up because it's just so heavy. So, you know, Nino comes in late at night because there's still a lot of non-believers in Georgia. So she starts praying and praying and praying all through the night. And then next thing you see is that the piece of timber just starts floating up into the air as if by a complete miracle. And mm. then the next day when all the workers come in, she's still there praying. And then she sees them come in and she lets the, the piece of timber drop right into place. And then, man, she's real cool. <laughs> I know. And then there, and then she finally found the tunic of Christ, and then they buried it in the church. Ah, uh, of course. They give it an actual burial, and that is one of the things she does. Um, and then the, she goes around, kind of proselytizing, you know, spreading her the faith. Or the Orthodox don't really proselytize, so she was just spreading the faith mm. to people who want to listen, and you know, doing all these miracles. And King Mirian's like saying he's going to kill anybody who doesn't convert to Christianity. Because, you know, that's free will and all. Of course. He, he converts most of them because it was, you know, political and economical. Because they they could they kicked out all the, the fire temple people. So they got all their money and land back. Um, give it to the churches and made it look, made made themselves look nice to Rome. And it's then, free real estate. It's free real estate. Um, <laughs> and and then Miriam dies. Then Nino dies, you know, while she's out prostatizing. They build the church there. And that is. Well, I like her. She's great. Yeah, I, I like her too. I actually have an icon of her in my room, so, so <laughs> it's great. And then you get an icon of Mirian now because of personal reasons. Yes. But yeah, that's the that's the life and times of Saint Nino because I give the too long didn't read version of it, and they're gonna the main podcast is gonna get the very long did read version. <laughs> well, I think that she's definitely a badass who deserves to be. More well known because clearly Gregory the Illuminator has come into popularity in both the East and the West because he has quite a large 
presence, but I feel like they have done Nino a disservice by not giving her the same. So at least on your podcast, you are spreading the great word of Saint Nino, and and I'm here for it. Yeah, which is why I wanted to do it with you, because I knew, like, you do all the lesser-known saints, like, Saint Walburga is one of my favorites. Yes, and it was Walpurgis Knock last night. It's her feast day today. <laughs> Ooh, see? Perfect timing. Um, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I love hearing about the women saints. And, you know, I had to include Rips to me because she is a big part of Nino's thing. And mm -hmm. I was reading about, you know, Gregory. And since Gregory and Nino kind of mishmash a lot, I, yeah. I wanted to have some of that people learning more about Gregory so they would have the background knowledge about Nino. So that way it's like, you have two saints, but these are the illuminators of the Caucasus because Albania um, decided to go a different route in the 600s. <laughs> oh, did they ever? <laughs> yeah, they, it became Azerbaijan. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they, they became very uh, Muslim. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is, they, they work perfectly together. They're very complementary saints and the stories, they do have quite a lot of overlap, which is great because again, like with saints narratives, a lot of the times they're trying to claim connection with other saints for legitimacy, but the way that Gregory and Nino sit together feels more genuine. Even though they're both working on a lot of convenient visions, their overlap is not with each other, but with the same time period and the same figures within that time period. Mainly, you know, Tiridates and Tripsimi. Or I, yeah. call him, I call him tiered that because of the how much I've read the Chronicles is just teared up to me now. Oh, it took me a while to figure out why someone, one person was just referred to him as Datar. That's different, so. Yeah, reading the Chronicles gets funky with names, and you're like, who is this? And I gotta use my handy-dandy Wikipedia articles because they'll have all the names listed out. I definitely made use of that for at least the naming conventions. <laughs> you need to do it with the naming conventions because it's, it's it gets rough. Like, I can read Georgian, so for me it's nice, but I also... Mm. I can read Georgian doesn't mean I can understand Georgian. So if I see a name, I'm like, that's a name. But other than that, I'm like, I don't know what this is. Yeah, they don't try to to make things. It's not a time period in which they were worried about the clarity of language or the cohesiveness of language, for sure. Oh, yeah. Well, I think we're going to end it here. Uh, where can people find you, Bree? You can find Pontifax at Pontifax Pod on all of your social medias and our podcast is available on all podcatchers or at pontifax.podbean.com. And I will give links to all of that in the episode transcription on Patreon once I figure out how to use it. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. And thank you so much for joining us today. I had a lot of fun learning about St. Gregory and I hope you enjoyed St. Nino. Oh, I had a lot of fun with St. Nino. I want to spend some more time with her in the future. So thank you so much for having me and, and sending me down that rabbit hole. Of course. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Sedurakai, I